In this video, we're going to talk about something called intrinsic semiconductors. Intrinsic. And the word intrinsic in the context of semiconductors can be thought of as pure. So it means all atoms are identical, or all atoms are same. So if you're dealing with an intrinsic silicon semiconductor, all atoms must be silicon. If it's intrinsic germanium semiconductor, all atoms must be germanium. Think of that, all right? What we'll do is we'll explore the electrical properties of these semiconductors, and what we'll find is this. You see, for metals, there are only one thing that's responsible for electric current, free electrons, right? But for semiconductors, turns out there are two things responsible for electric current. One are the electrons, what are the others? Well, we'll find out in this video. So we'll take a specific example and work with it. So let's say we take silicon, okay? We'll first look at how a silicon forms a crystal, and then we'll look at its electrical properties. To do that, first let's write down the electronic configuration of silicon. Silicon has 14 electrons. So its electronic configuration would be 1s2, then it'll have 2s and 2p, they will be completely filled, you have two and six. That makes it 10, so will 3s and 3p will also be involved. And 3s will be two, 3p would be just two. And you may, you may have already studied in chemistry that atoms love this thing called as octet structure. They would like their final energy shell. They would like their uh, final orbit to be completely, final shell to be completely filled with electrons, eight electrons, octet. Our silicon only has four electrons in its final shell, right? So it needs four more. How does it get that? Well, if you take a silicon crystal, all, where all atoms are silicon, all atoms are in need of these four electrons, so guess what they will do? They will end up sharing their electrons, and this is called as covalent bonds. So silicons end up forming covalent bonds with each other. And so if you could see that, it, it might look somewhat like this. So here it is, I'm gonna draw. These are the silicon atoms which are covalently bonded with each other, all right? Now don't take this diagram too literally, all these lines are just for representation, but here's the way to think about it. Look at this silicon for atom, for example. It has four outermost electrons. These are the four electrons. We're not showing the innermost electrons. And what the silicon is doing is it's sharing with four of its neighbors. And so as a result, notice each silicon atom has now eight electrons in its, in its uh, vicinity. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this silicon is happy. And look at this silicon. It's even having, even this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That one is not shown. So all silicon atoms have eight electrons, access to it. And as a result of this sharing, they're all happy. And in fact, this is what keeps the entire crystal together, okay? So now the big question is, what about its conducting properties? Can the silicon conduct? Well, that really depends upon the temperature, it turns out. So what we'll do is we'll start off with very low temperatures. Let's go absolutely low. Let's go to absolute zero. If you're at the very low temperature, like very close to absolute zero, what do you think will the silicon crystal do? Will it conduct? Well, it has so many electrons, right? But the question is, can they conduct? The answer can only be given by looking at the band diagram of this. In previous videos, we have spent some time talking about this band structure, band theory of solids. And if you need more clarity or you need a refresher, it would be a great idea to go back, watch those videos, and then come back over here. But anyways, you would see that for semiconductors, the valence band, the band which has uh, highest occupied electrons, the valence band, is completely filled. And then you have this gap in the energy which is not allowed for any electrons, we call the forbidden energy gap. And then you have this next energy band which electrons can occupy, all right? And at, at absolutely zero, temp, uh, zero Kelvin, all the electrons have occupied these states. So if you were to look at individual states, we'll just draw that, we'll show that. So if you were to look at the individual states, uh, recall that uh, a band is actually a collection of all these sp uh, states, I'm now showing some of those, then each state has two electrons in it. Remember, Pauli's exclusion principle, uh, one will be up spin, one will be down spin. A third electron can't be over here, the next electron will be on the next state, and so on. All these electrons are filled in this valence band, and there are no empty states available. As a result, if we were to put an electric field over here, none of these electrons would conduct. 
And the reason for that is if an electron wants to conduct, if it wants to accelerate, its energy should increase, right? More kinetic energy. And so none of the electrons will, well, if the energy has to increase, well, there has to be an energy state available for the electron to go to, right? But all the energy states are filled, so the electron's energy cannot increase. And as a result, none of these electrons will conduct. And so this whole solid acts like an insulator. So at zero Kelvin, this whole material acts like an insulator, and the reason it acts like an insulator is because, well, there are no empty uh, energy states available. So what happens if we increase the temperature? Let's say we bring it all the way to room temperature. Well, let's find out. I have it ready down over here. Excellent, so imagine we are now, we are now at room temperature. Let's say that's about what? That's about 300 Kelvin. What will happen now? Well, now at this temperature, there's a lot of thermal energies available. And as a result, some of these electrons can absorb this thermal energy and uh, jump or get excited from valence band into the conduction band. So maybe this electron over here, maybe that one absorbs some thermal energy, gets excited, and maybe it jumps all the way to this state. And maybe that electron let's say is this electron over here. And so as a result, now if we apply an electric field, this electron is free to move. Why? It's free to accelerate because it, it can increase its energy further now because states are available. It couldn't do that before, but now it can. And so we're gonna say that this now is a free electron. And to show that for representation, we usually, we're gonna put that outside the covalent bond, saying that it is not stuck over here, it is free to move around, and it can do that. And notice, not only did we get a free electron, but because that electron, now imagine that electron moves away somewhere, and because of that, notice there is a vacant space available. In the valence band, this state is now free, free for some other electron to come and occupy. And because there's a lot of you know, thermal agitation, maybe this electron goes and occupies that. So maybe this electron goes and occupies that. And you may be asking like, why would that electron do that? It's randomness. Before it couldn't move, but now there's an empty state, it can move, it's random, all right? So as a result, in the valence band, if you look at the band diagram, maybe that electron was, I don't know, maybe it was this electron, or maybe this electron, I don't know. So that electron will now go, and it has taken this space. And as a result, the vacant site has moved. Now that this is the vacant site. And maybe another electron, maybe this electron now, can take up this site, all right? Maybe it's this electron. That's the one that's going over there. So, all right, all I'm showing is showing some electrons jumping from one place to another due to thermal, uh, thermal randomness. And notice, as a result, can you see that this empty space, this vacant space, sort of feels like it's moving around? Does it make sense? So instead of saying it's the electrons that are jumping from one place to another, what we like to do is we like to think that this vacant space itself is moving freely. I know it doesn't make sense because vacant space is not a particle to do that, but we like to think of it that way. So what we like to do is we like to put a circle over here and we're gonna call that thing as a hole, all right? We're gonna call that as a hole. And the whole idea <laughs> behind this hole is that we think of hole as a particle and we think of it as, as freely movable. So we're going to assume that it can freely move throughout this entire crystal, all right? And that's why we get current due to two particles. One are the electrons, and another one are the holes. And guess what, these holes act like positive charge carriers. And here's why. See, imagine if you were to put an electric field like this, if you were to put an electric field over here, then notice this electron, this free electron, will accelerate this way, right? It'll accelerate in this direction. And similarly, this electron, well, it cannot, it's not free, but it can go, jump from here to here. And as a result, it seems as if the hole has moved here. And then the hole moves here, and the moves here. So can you see that this hole, it's as if the hole, if you treat it as a particle, it's as if the hole is moving in the same direction as the electric field. Does that make sense? And that's why we like to think of holes as positively charged particles. And so, in semiconductors, there are two things responsible for current. One are the electrons, but the other ones are holes.
A couple of notes to end the video. First one is that even though holes are, we treat them as positively charged particle, don't think that they are going to attract the electrons. They don't attract the electrons at all. You can think of them, they're independently moving. All right, but of course, if an electron comes very close to a hole, yes, it can fall into that hole, but don't think they're attracting each other. Another thing is with the band diagram. Notice that if you were to carefully draw the electrons in the band diagram, we have to be so careful that we cannot put more than two electrons in a horizontal line because you see, uh, each level can only have two electrons maximum, right? With one upspin and one downspin, but that makes it so tedious to draw all of this. And so you know what we'll do usually? Usually, we forget about all these energy levels and we randomly draw electrons everywhere. I know that's not very accurate, but that's easier to draw. So if you were to show electrons and holes over here, from now onwards in future videos, I'll just draw them like this. I'll just show a few electrons over here all around. In reality, only two electrons can occupy a particular state, but let's relax that now. And then I'll show a bunch of, bunch of holes over here. And we'll imagine these are all freely moving. Okay, so it's not very accurate, I repeat, but it's easier to draw that way. And this is very easy to represent that, all right? All right, one last thing, let's end with an analogy. I like to think of these electrons as water in this water bottle. This empty water bottle is just like a conduction band with a lot of space, and as a result, water can move freely through it. And you can think of this valence band, which is completely filled with water, as a completely filled water bottle like this. But the holes then will represent these tiny air bubbles. These air bubbles are like vacant sites. These are the places where the water should have been, but it's not there. And as a result, even now notice these air bubbles seem to move. Of course, in reality, it's the water that's actually filling up that place and that vacant site ends up moving, but it really feels like this air bubble itself is a particle. So that's the idea behind holes. And that's why we like to think of holes as a particle.